It was funny because right at the start when I first met him, I was on the Terminator and I walked into the set and he was sitting in the corner and he looked at me up and down and he said, nah, too tall. And so I figured that, you know, that was the end of my job. And I turned around, he goes, I'm just joking, sit down here and have a cigar. <laughs> and so I became acting coach, confidant, ski partner. Yeah, all of those things and work out every day. I mean, I couldn't even escape it, even if I'd taken a beating on the set, mm -hmm. you know, and T2 getting pounded every day. And then he goes, ah, oh, Peter, we go to the gym now. I'm like, I can barely drag my butt back to the hotel. <laughs> I'm Peter McCulley. That's Peter Kent of Qualicum Beach on Vancouver Island, who for 15 years was a stunt double for Arnold Schwarzenegger. As you can imagine, he was tossed around, run over, and beat up. A lot. Peter talks about his adventures as a stuntman, life with Arnold, and life after Arnold, when Today in BC continues. Why spend hours searching dealerships, comparing makes and models? Find the best of BC's inventory in one place, todaysdrive.com. You'll have access to inventory across BC, where you can easily find a vehicle that fits your needs and gets you where you need to go in comfort. Get in the driver's seat. Don't miss out on the many options we have available for you. Powered by Black Press Media, todaysdrive.com connects you with exclusive new and used car deals. Peter, you're originally from North Vancouver. Your online biography that I was reading says that you were, quote unquote, predestined to be a thrill seeker and an adrenaline addict. Perhaps you could elaborate on exactly what you were doing to earn that <laughs> description at such a young age and what effect that had on your friends and your family. My mom was, uh, later on, was a single mom, but my dad was always at work. And so when I was a little kid, usually I would be out in our backyard in North Van, which was quite wild area, a lot of big trees. So I would be climbing to the top of uh, what seemed to be 100 feet to me, but of course, it was probably only 30 or 40. Nonetheless, off the ground and holding on to something that was about the diameter of a pencil and swinging back and forth with it. And my mom, you know, I'd call her, I'd say, Mom, come out here. And she would come out, wiping her hands on the apron, looking around at ground level to see where I was. And I'd be up here, <laughs> you know. So, And then we used to have a trick where we would climb down part of the tree and then let go and just fall through the branches to the ground and let the branches break your fall. So you get scraped up pretty good. You know, gravel pits out there running and jumping off the cliff and landing in the soft gravel below and those kinds of things. All good training to be a stuntman. I guess so. I mean, at the, <laughs> you know, never thought about it at that point, but yeah, it seems to have been. You had a number of jobs growing up, up and down the island and in your early 20s that were pretty tough. I guess it's kind of standard fare for West Coast, though. You know, paving crew, uh, worked on that for a year and a half. Commercial fishing for almost two years out in, up in Alaska and uh, at the top of the island and all around Cape Scott and Captain's Cove and up in there. So that's some hard work. And I have extreme admiration for those guys, any of them, because just being out there on the water is dangerous enough, let alone with the hours that you put in and, you know, getting up every morning after three or four hours sleep and going back in there and chasing the fish. Log sorting um, down at the old... Doman's Mill, which used to exist down uh, where the landing is now beside the BC Ferries in Nanaimo. So I worked on a log sorter out there. I worked in Shimana Sawmill. I worked in Harmac. So yeah, pretty much, you know, whatever you could get to earn some money as a kid. Were you always the biggest guy in the lunchroom? Uh, maybe. <laughs> I never looked around that way. I was usually pretty tired. <laughs> <laughs> I bet. <laughs> you get tired of all that, obviously. And in your 20s, you moved to Los Angeles. So what prompted that? What made you decide to move to California? That was a series of events. So I started out in Nanaimo. I used to sell stereos because my background had been audio. I was a sound engineer on the road for Dion Concert Systems for a few years, supplying PA systems and you know, music and all that stuff. Then I went to work for Kelly Stereo Mart in Nanaimo. And then from there, I went down to Victoria to work at the old A&B Sound, which was the legendary one on Yates Street. And it was about 83, and the market was doing rather poorly. And we were all on direct commission sales. So you know, if you didn't make any money, you didn't eat. I had always been in theater, thanks to my teacher, Les Dickinson at NDSS, who I'm still friends with today, who put me in my first play. And so I looked around and I had done plays before. I kind of got this crazy idea. I looked at Los Angeles and said, I'm going to go down there, you know, and I'm going to try and be in a movie. And, you know, when you think about the ludicrousness of that idea, just the concept, you know, they call it the Boulevard of Broken Dreams and they don't call it that for nothing. But I mean, I was pretty naive. So I took that naivety and ran with it. So you didn't know anybody in California, no connections, you just moved down there. I understand you lived at the YMCA off of Sunset Strip. So would it be fair to say that was a big change from life on Vancouver Island? Yeah, you know, um, 
When I first got there and I arrived on Thanksgiving evening, and I remember taking the bus from uh, the airport, sitting right at the front behind the driver, just like, you know, looking out the window and all excited. And I, he caught that, you know, and he's like, oh, here's another one of these kids come from God knows where. He pulled up in front of the Hollywood Roosevelt Hotel, which was Rudolph Valentino's hangout. And so um, he said, do you know where you are? And I said, no. And he goes, boy, this is Hollywood. <laughs> and I was like, whoa, okay. And so I got off and that was my very first night there. I was staying in there at 55 bucks a night and I realized with the short money that I had, I couldn't stay there very long. So the next night I went over and found the YMCA and spent some time in there. But yeah, you know, I would get up every morning and just walk around the streets of Hollywood, goggle-eyed, like Alice in Wonderland kind of thing going, wow. And you were obviously trying out for plays and TV shows. And- when I first got there, I really didn't know how I was going to do it. It was just a concept. And then suddenly I found myself in the quicksand. So what I did was every day I went out and found a little newspaper that I thought was like the industry Bible. But actually it was something some guy probably printed in his home and then put out at the Seven Eleven. And it just had all these little mostly non-union shows and you could call them up. So I would get a pile of change every morning and stand beside the payphone at the Y and just feed quarters in and call all these numbers. And eventually one day I found a company and they said, well, send us over a headshot. Well, I didn't have a headshot. I had Polaroids back in the day. I didn't have anything professional at all, but I sent that to them. And I came back one day and there was a phone message for me at the desk of the Y and it said, call this number. And I called them and they said, oh, by the way, we're doing this little movie called The Terminator. (laughs) And the direct, we're doing the background casting, the director's seen your photo and thinks you would be great for as a stand-in, which is for lighting for Arnold Schwarzenegger go over to ABC Television Center on Royal Main Street, which happened to be only a block away. So I walked over there, and there was Jim Cameron. He walked by, and he goes, oh, hey, you're here for the Arnold thing, right? And I'm like, yeah. We talked for a brief second. He goes, you Canadian? I'm like, yeah. And he goes, well, I'm from Toronto. And I said, oh, Vancouver. And he goes, oh, great. And he goes, well, you're perfect size for the lighting. And he goes, you got the job. Great. (laughs) And then he took a step away, and he turned back and looked at me, and he said, you ever done stunts before? And I thought, well, if I don't say something to this and address it, I might not have the other job and I really need it. And that's, you know, my first movie. So I said, oh, yeah, sure, sure. And he goes, great. He turned to Donna Smith, who was the unit production manager, and said, sign him up. So I was working for $40 a day flat for that whole picture, non-union. And doing stunts? Yep. So you've never done stunts and what happened when they said, do this? I tried to the best of my ability, (laughs) but it finally caught up with me when Arnold got shotgun backwards through the plate glass window in the tech noir scene where Reese blows him backwards through the window with a shotgun. And so it came to me and said, you know, get dressed, come do this. So I stepped up to the window, which had a lip on it about up to my knee. And Frank Orsati, who was the stunt coordinator, said to me, "Um, do you want a, a ramp? And I looked at him like a cow staring at a passing train, you know, and and he's like, you don't know what you're doing, do you? He goes, I've been watching you, you know, you're pulling it off, but you you don't really have a clue. You never done. And I'm like, yeah, okay, I'm busted. I thought I was out. And he's like, well, I'm putting a ramp in here for you because you've got to be able to step up high enough on the window that you don't catch your heels. If you catch your heels, you go right to the back of your head on the cement. And so, you know, he kept watch over me. Basically, he goes, I can't have you getting killed on my watch. That was the beginning of it. I just kind of got trained as I went along, which realistically is not the best way to enter the business. So was he with you for um, quite a number of movies? That was the only one. He was the one that helped me out the first time. And then when we did Commando, one of the guys who did the swinging across the Galleria on the banner, Mm -hmm. I offered to do it. Of course, I had no clue what I was doing. I just said, I'll do that. (laughs) <laughs> swing about because 85 because I've done it in a tree in North Vancouver <laughs> exactly. swing about 85 feet about uh, 70 feet above the deck on the concrete but they had hired this guy named Bob Yerkes who was a circus performer he also ran the training facility for Circus of the Stars which was an old TV series where they took actors and trained them to be circus performers. He admired my hubris, and he said to me, well, great, you know, I'm doing it anyway, and he did it in one take. Then he said, come out to my facility that I have out in the valley, and I'll train you. Went out there almost every day, and we practiced trampoline and flips and high falls and all that stuff. And to his credit, Bob had set the careers of a whole lot of stunt guys. He had guys that would come out there that he would let live on his property and train them while they were there for free. So you worked on 14 films with Arnold Schwarzenegger over 13, 14 years. You must have had a few injuries. Oh, yeah. Almost been killed a time or two. There was probably many times when I should have been killed. And if I'd stepped off the curb one second sooner, would I have been hit by that bus kind of thing? Or if I hadn't, uh, I've been hit with a three-ton shipping container 100 feet in the air, woken up peeing blood a few times and had to go back to work. (laughs) So, yeah. In Terminator 2, you had a latex mold of Arnold's face glued on your face yeah. every day. Yeah. What was that like? Hideous. The, the thing was, it had never been done before. And I was the very first guy to try it out. So I was the crash test dummy. 
What happened was our makeup artist, Jeff Don, who I'd worked with and, and had worked with for all those films with Arnold and, and Peter Toth, Paul, his hairdresser, Jeff came up with this idea that they could make a mold which was the sum and difference of Arnold's and my faces, and then they would glue it on me. And so James Cameron said, oh, this is a fabulous idea because then I can push him with a camera and Peter can do these stunts and no one can tell him apart. Put it on him. Six and a half hour job the very first time, so I had to sit still for all that time. Jim said uh, on the radio, is it done? And yep, yeah, okay, get on the bike, Peter, and ride past the house. So I went and got the Harley and put the leather jacket on, and he came out on the front step and watched me go by, and I was like, please don't give me a thumbs up, and he did. And so I was stuck in it for 66-plus days. They whittled it down to about four and a half hours to put it on, but still, yeah, it wasn't fun. So let's talk about being a stuntman in general terms. Would I be correct in assuming that computer-generated effects that they use today are a big part of today's movies and probably a lot of what a stuntman's job was in the past? It's interesting you bring that up because, yes, it's not like it used to be. There's a couple reasons for that. Back in our day, everything was done practically. So when I ran across the big rig in T2 and climbed up on the window and blew the window out, jumped to the side, we flipped the truck over, all that was done for real. 60 miles an hour, hands-free. If I fell, I was dead. Nowadays, because it's cheaper, for one, they can do that, but it's on a, a giant green screen stage. So they would light the green screen and superimpose the background on that. They would have the truck basically standing still with a fan on my back, and I would just run up there. So if I fell, it was you know no harm, no foul. Also far cheaper, right? You don't have to rent a physical location and spend the time to do all of that and run the risk. And Jim actually said, funny enough, to that stunt, two years later after T2 was released, they released the box set on DVD. And if you watch the making of on that disc, Jim actually says, I would never do that gag because Peter probably would have been killed. And I'm like, well, thanks for adding that two years later after the fact, right, Jim? Because it was. It was one of those things where if I fell, I was a dead man under the wheels of that rig. From the latest community news to informative, entertaining reads for travelers and the cannabis curious, just visit your local Black Press Media community newspaper website to sign up today. I'm Peter McCulley. Today in BC is a Black Press Media podcast. You work with Arnold Schwarzenegger for 14 years. I'm guessing you guys became pretty close. It was funny because right at the start when I first met him, I was on the Terminator and I walked into the set and he was sitting in the corner and he looked at me up and down and he said, nah, too tall. And so I figured that, you know, that was the end of my job. And I turned around, he goes, I'm just joking, sit down here and have a cigar. And, and it kind of started off that way. And then I started making coffee for him. And then one time he asked me to cook for him. And then he found out that I had an acting background. And so he used to get me to read with him because that way I could read the dialogue back for the other characters and we could do it in private. Mm -hmm. And then I became his acting coach, giving him tips on things that we could improve upon. Because at that point I was also working as an actor when I wasn't doing stunts. And so I became acting coach, confidant, ski partner, yeah, all of those things, and work out every day. I mean, I couldn't even escape it, even if I'd taken a beating on the set, mm -hmm. you know, and T2 getting pounded every day. And then he goes, ah, Peter, we go to the gym now. I'm like, I can barely drag my butt back to the hotel. <laughs> Did he make you do the same diet, the raw eggs and the whole deal? It depended on the day and, and what the movie was. I mean, it depended how much was being revealed. Mm -hmm. But I had to work out pretty hard to catch up with him, obviously. This is a guy who was Olympia several times. When I first started working with him, I was only just basically at the beginning of my workout career. So I realized I had to catch up pretty quick. He proved to be a really great uh, training partner because uh, there was no mercy. You must have a fun story or two you can share. Given the amount of money that he had, we would be out shopping like we were in Mexico City when we did uh, Total Recall. We were walking around and, and looking at you know high-end jewelry and, um, and artwork and all that stuff. And he's like, Peter, I like this painting, buy it. And I'm like, but you have, you know, the Amex Black, which is unlimited. And you're asking me to buy, yeah, but it's back at the hotel. So I'd end up having to buy stuff for him on my card. And then once a month, I'd have to go by his office and they'd reimburse me for it all. It sounds like you socialized with Arnold as well as uh, work out and whatnot. Pretty much. I mean, I was bodyguard to him on several occasions, you know, and driver. And, you know, we were in the gym the uh, restaurant every morning. We'd work out, then we'd go have breakfast. And then sometimes we'd go back to his place. So if you're working out and then you're going for breakfast, maybe you can tell us what that breakfast looked like, because I'm sure it had a few more carbs in it than mine. There's a place called The Firehouse in Santa Monica, which was an old converted firehouse, and now it's a restaurant famous for the bodybuilders that go there. And so it would usually be like oatmeal and then three or four egg white omelet toast on the side of that. So yeah, pretty clean though. No bacon? Once in a <laughs> while. Well, I would order the bacon and he'd pretend he wasn't going to order it and then he'd steal it off my plate. 
I heard you mention uh, the word cigar as we were chatting along oh, yeah. here, and and I saw Arnold on the cover of Cigar Aficionado yeah. some years ago, yeah. and at that time I was uh, coveting Cohibas. Mm-hmm. So uh, did you share the love of cigars as well? I did. Funny enough, when I first met him, I was smoking Old Port Cigarellos, <laughs> which he found quite offensive, and in truth they are. Rum-soaked, wine-dipped, or whatever it was, <laughs> I forget the, the adage now. I remember him the first time, and he pulled a cigar out of the box and stuck it in my mouth and made me light it up. And, of course, they were all Cubans at a time when, in the U.S., you weren't supposed to have any association with Cuba or get Cuban cigars, for that matter. Speaking of cigar aficionado, I remember over the years going with him once in New York when we were shooting there into the office of cigar aficionado and hanging out with the CAO who had massive walk-in humidor, you know, the size of this room. And another time was uh, Maria went to interview, his wife Maria Schreiber went to interview Fidel Castro in Cuba on Arnold's private jet, back when you weren't even supposed to go to Cuba. So when she came back, Fidel apparently had been told by his doctor that he couldn't smoke cigars anymore, that he was supposed to stop. So he had, uh, they're called Trinidad, and they were his private brand. So four boxes of Trinidads came in. You can imagine the value of those cigars. Uh, Not only were they expensive cigars to begin with, but they were from Fidel's private stock. So I managed to get a few of those. What did it mean to you to become the first Canadian inducted into the Hollywood Stuntman's Hall of Fame? It's a super nice honor. And, you know, in truth, I didn't really expect it. It was one of those things where my wife actually said, you should be in there. And I thought, I guess so. I really wasn't looking for it. And then uh, talked to um, the president of the association, and he said, well, what an oversight this is. Of course, you should be for all the motorcycle work and that you did in Terminator 2 and the truck transfer and the bike jump and all of those things. You know, I'm pretty much the only guy that's in there from Canada. So, yeah, it's quite the honor. So after life in California, you've moved to Squamish. And at one point, you ran for municipal council there. What made you decide to you toss your hat in the ring, and, and how did you enjoy the experience? I've always liked to champion the underdog. At the time in Squamish, there was a big issue, and there still is, in fact. It's still overhanging, which is the LNG plant that they intended to build at the mouth of the estuary there and right in the end of Howe Sound. I voiced my opinions a few times, and people said, you know, you're good at at putting that out there. Why don't you run? I enjoyed the experience a lot. It's a different job every day. It's It's not like doing stunts, obviously, but there's a lot of mental ones involved. And, you know, in truth, you're dealing with other people's money, You want to make sure it's spent prudently. You're elected by the people. The reason that they're in that seat is because people trust them and they want them to listen. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's one of the key things is being able to just sit and say, okay, yes, I mean, this is is what we need to do and this is what I've been directed to do. So that's what I'm doing. How did you meet your partner? And tell me about getting engaged. I met her the day after my mom passed away. So I had, my dad had passed away in 89 when I was on Total Recall of Mexico. Then my mom passed away in 2005. And so the next day, literally, I went into the coffee shop in Parksville and my wife was there and we hit it off. She was taking her nursing degree. I said, when you pass, we'll go to Italy. And when we were in Italy, I proposed to her on the Bridge of Sighs in Venice. We went to Squamish right after we got engaged. Then we spent 14 years there. We have twin boys. You know, it's one of the greatest things, I think, ever being a dad. Yeah, and then, you know, the time that we spent there, she worked in that hospital, and then we came back over here in 2018 because she has family here. I have none. Literally, the day that my mom passed away, I was the only guy in the world by myself. And then the next day, suddenly, I have this massive expanded family full of lunacy. It's been a great ride. Just shortly after you arrived here, your wife, who is a nurse, was uh, put in a very unique position with COVID. Right when COVID first hit and she was, on, you know, a frontline worker, The exposure was a big concern for all of us and, you know, not getting it into the family or the kids or the in-laws or any of that. So the in-laws had a trailer we put at the side of the house and she lived in that for several months, just trying to self-isolate. So I would bring out food and stuff and put it on the steps and we'd talk through FaceTime and because it was a bit of a scary time. Nobody really knew what we were dealing with. It hasn't gotten a whole lot better. I guess at this point now it's sort of, well, it's part of life. So we always ask this question on this podcast whenever we can. I'd like to know if there's any wisdom that you'd like to pass along to the younger generation. Well, I think if I can impart one thing, it's to follow your dreams and to not give up. I think that's a real key piece. Certain issues come at you in life and you quit. 
And you never know what might be around the corner if you just don't take that step. And if you just go that little extra mile or whatever it takes and not quit just to see what might happen, I would not have had that experience with Arnold if I hadn't just said, I'm going to get on a plane and fly to LA, as crazy as it may have been. Whether it's the arts or whatever it is you're doing, follow that and just see where it takes you. And don't quit being true to yourself. As, you know, as they say in Hamlet, to thine own self be true. That's this edition of Today in BC. If you have suggestions or comments, send us a voice message to podcast at blackpress.ca. You may become part of our podcast mailbag segment. You'll find Today in BC podcasts on iTunes, Spotify, Amazon, iHeart, and Google Podcasts.